the next large fish you say they look very much unlike the fish we expect on the fish market. Here, one that has these two appendages, this is a measure to overcome the difficulty of finding a mate with this low density that the females uh, adopt the males as dwarf males and they become parasitically attached to the female just ready for reproduction but nothing else, not even to feed themselves. Now I'm not elaborating on this, <laughs> uh, but here you have some uh, uh, tunicates and this looks like a, 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 a a giant beast with an open mouth <laughs> completely even the specialist would not would be hard pressed to see what phylum they belong to here Polythurian sea cucumbers crawling on the uh, like here on the horse floating and certainly not you would not say this is a sea cucumber but it is and it kind of does or these are, well, this is almost like a worm, but with very long para, uh, pseudopodia or parapodia. And this is uh, a worm, worm, early stage of a worm. Or this is a relative of our little bug, isopods. An octopus, squids, very strange, very exotic. Here, this is a pteropod snail, its shell reduced to this, and the rest is soft body and completely unlike other pteropods we know, planktonic gastropods. Uh, or you have, yeah some other jellyfish, tenophores, that look like gooseberries, but this one does not at all. Only you see these zones where uh, locomotive cilia are arranged. And no wonder you find many living fossils, gastropods that we knew fossil from the Silurian, the last representative, and then all of a sudden it showed up Neopilina in the deep sea. <coughs> or this kind of fish known from Solenhof, uh, of, of crustacean. And uh, here is a modern representative belonging to the same class as a living fossil. <coughs> now, if we go to the laws, <coughs> I have these are all in the open water. Now here is a reason from a recent publication out of one core taken in the deep sea of the coast of North America. I uh, think of South North Carolina. In, in this one core there were many more than these. Ostracots, ostracots, you know, nation, very little crustaceans, shrimp-like, but with two valves that look like a, uh, a clam. And they are usually very boring in their morphology, and I know it because my wife did her dissertation on these osteocons, <laughs> and I, I, I always deplored her choice because it was so boring. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the deep sea. <laughs> and this was the surprise. Instead of these very boring, smooth, uh, egg-shaped shells, you see here, and I've selected ones that I call jet planes. Yes, they invented the principle of the jet plane without any engineer. And you see that they all have one thing. Here it starts 
And these are not from one family, but different families. But you see another, this spout, this spout, this spout. You see this spout here? That's the jet. That means when you close the valves, you take in the water in front, close the valves, the legs beat and make the current and you focus that current in a spout, you have a jet. <laughs> From the morphology, it is clear that they must have moved in this jet motion. And in addition, they needed wings, of course. So you see wings starting here and here just or a spine in the wing place and then you see uh, here uh, some ribs coming in that guide the water to the wing for the lift. And you see the wing developing and here even the landing devices. You see these, these <laughs> little spines at the end, the triangular wing and here again guiding sculpture in this form. Even feathers, feather-like seat in an ostracot. Unthought of, but it's the invention of the jet plane, and this will be an interesting subject to study because this takes place not only in high compressed, highly compressed water, but at a microscopic size. This scale is one-tenth of a millimeter. So, you know, you can hardly see them. At this size, water that we would say is normal water is felt by the organism as if it were honey, highly viscous, the so-called uh, uh, Reynolds number, very low Reynolds numbers, and therefore they behave like a jet plane at a larger size in a much less viscous medium and this is a challenge to model it and measure and, and experiment how well they are adapted. In the Devonian we have these were quaternary, probably all living today, but collected where they were assembled in the core in the sediment. This is from deep sea sediment of the, of the Devonian not yet invented the jet, not yet invented the, uh, the wing, but ribs that go along and create little vortices as we know from rife studies and thereby lubricate the surface as if it, as if it was a ball, ball and pillow structure. So invention also there, almost like rockets. Now, as we are at the floor, deep sea floors are available in the fossil record to a large extent. Actually, we have many, many, much, much more area of deep sea floor has been studied by paleontologists than zoologists ever saw in the present deep sea because they are exposed in sediments and here comes the geology we have the plate tectonics and plates are being pressed against the continents and as they are pressed they are split into the lower part that becomes subducted and remelted and the lighter sediments on top split off and are piled up like, uh, like carpets on the continents. This makes the folded mountains and there we find these originally deep sea deposits in the folded mountains. And here's one example in uh, northern Spain. Every one of these beds is one event, 